Todd. Good day, everyone. We are coming on the air with some breaking news. It's a major development in the investigation of Russian interference into the 2016 election. It's the indictment of 13 Russian nationals. These are the first criminal indictments tied directly to Russian involvement in the 2016 election. And it's a revealing look, the indictment itself, at just how the Russians did it. In a few minutes, we're going to hear from Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein. He'll appear before cameras at the Justice Department to go through this indictment in what can only be called a hastily arranged news conference announced literally just about 25 minutes ago. My colleague Tom Costello is here with me in Washington. He and I have been racing through this indictment, learning a lot of stuff. Tom, share some of the highlights in this indictment. It's, it's very thick, uh, and there is a lot of detail, but let me read some of the highlights. And again, this is uh, just breaking now. It says here that from in or around 2014 to the present, to the present, defendants knowingly and intentionally conspired with each other and with persons known and unknown to the grand jury to defraud the United States by impairing, obstructing, and defeating the lawful functions of the government through fraud, deceit, for the purposes of interfering with the U.S. elections. How did they do this? The defendants posing as U.S. persons and creating false U.S. personas operated social media pages essentially designed to attract U.S. audiences. These groups and pages which addressed divisive U.S. political and social issues falsely claimed to be controlled by U.S. activists when in fact they were controlled by defendants, by Russians. Let me give you a couple of examples. The organization, there is one internet research organization, Russian-based, which is among the 13 defendants, had a strategic goal to sow discord in the U.S. political system, including the presidential elections. They posted derogatory information about a number of candidates, and in early to mid-2016, they included supporting the presidential campaign of Donald Trump and disparaging Hillary Clinton. They go on to say, buying political advertisements. Here's the attorney general. Presented by the special counsel's office. The indictment charges 13 Russian nationals and three Russian companies for committing federal crimes while seeking to interfere in the United States political system, including the 2016 presidential election. The defendants allegedly conducted what they called information warfare against the United States, with the stated goal of spreading distrust towards the candidates and the political system in general. According to the allegations in the indictment, 12 of the individual defendants worked at various times for a company called Internet Research Agency, LLC, a Russian company based in St. Petersburg. The other individual defendant, Yevgeny Viktorovich Bogosin, funded the conspiracy through companies known as Concord Management and Consulting, LLC, Concord Catering, and many affiliates and subsidiaries. The conspiracy was part of a larger operation called Project LACTA. Project LACTA included multiple components, some involving domestic audiences within the Russian Federation and others targeting foreign audiences in multiple countries. Internet Research Agency allegedly operated through Russian shell companies. It employed hundreds of people in its online operations, ranging from creators of fictitious personas to technical and administrative support personnel with an annual budget of millions of dollars. The Internet Research Agency was a structured organization headed by a management group and arranged into departments, including graphics, search engine optimization, information technology, and finance departments. In 2014, the company established a translator project focused on the United States. In July of 2016, more than 80 employees were assigned to the translator project. Two of the defendants allegedly traveled to the United States in 2014 to collect intelligence for their American influence operations. In order to hide the Russian origins of their activities, the defendants allegedly purchased space on computer servers located here in the United States in order to set up a virtual private network. The defendants allegedly used that infrastructure to establish hundreds of accounts on social media networks, such as Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, making it appear that those accounts were controlled by persons located in the United States. 
They used stolen or fictitious American identities, fraudulent bank accounts, and false identification documents. The defendants posed as politically and socially active Americans, advocating for and against particular candidates. They established social media pages and groups to communicate with unwitting Americans. They also purchased political advertisements on social media networks. The Russians also recruited and paid real Americans to engage in political activities, promote political campaigns, and stage political rallies. The defendants and their co-conspirators pretended to be grassroots activists. According to the indictment, the Americans did not know that they were communicating with Russians. After the election, the defendants allegedly staged rallies to support the president-elect, while simultaneously staging rallies to protest his election. For example, the defendants organized one rally to support the president-elect and another rally to, impose, uh, to oppose him, both in New York on the same day. On September 13th of 2017, soon after the news media reported that the special counsel's office was investigating evidence that Russian operatives had used social media to interfere with the 2016 election, one defendant allegedly wrote, quote, we had a slight crisis here at work. The FBI busted our activity. So I got preoccupied with covering tracks together with my colleagues, end quote. The indictment includes eight criminal counts. Count one alleges a criminal conspiracy to defraud the United States by all of the defendants. The defendants allegedly conspired to defraud America by impairing the lawful functions of the Federal Election Commission the United States Department of Justice, and the Department of State. Those uh, organizations of the U.S. government are responsible for administering federal requirements for disclosure of foreign involvement in certain domestic activities. Count two charges conspiracy to commit wire fraud and bank fraud by internet research agency and two of the individual defendants. And counts three through eight charge aggravated identity theft by internet research agency and four individuals. Now there is no allegation in this indictment that any American was a knowing participant in this illegal activity. There is no allegation in the indictment that the charge conduct altered the outcome of the 2016 election. I want to caution you that everyone charged with a crime is presumed innocent unless and until proven guilty in court. At trial, prosecutors must introduce credible evidence that is sufficient to prove each defendant guilty beyond any reasonable doubt to a unanimous jury. The special counsel's investigation is ongoing. There will be no comments from the special counsel at this time. This indictment serves as a reminder that people are not always who they appear to be on the internet. The indictment alleges that the Russian conspirators want to promote discord in the United States and undermine public confidence in democracy. We must not allow them to succeed. The Department of Justice will continue to work cooperatively with other law enforcement and intelligence agencies and with the Congress to defend our nation against similar current and future efforts. I want to thank the federal agents and prosecutors who are working on this case for their exceptional service. And I'll be happy to take a few questions. Is there concern that this indictment undermines the outcome of the election? What I have identified for you are the allegations in the indictment. There's no allegation in the indictment of any effect on the outcome of the election. Jessica. On page four of the indictment, paragraph six, it specifically talks about the Trump campaign, saying that defendants communicated with unwitting individuals associated with the Trump campaign. My question is, later in the indictment, Campaign officials are referenced, not by their name, by, by campaign official one or two or three. Were campaign officials cooperative, or were they duped? What was their relationship with this? Again, there's no allegation in this indictment that any American had any knowledge. And the nature of the scheme was that the defendants took extraordinary steps to make it appear that they were ordinary American political activists, even going so far as to base their activities on a virtual private network here in the United States. So if anybody traced it back to that first jump, they appear to be Americans. Catherine. I take one more question. 
have you had any assurances from the Russians that they will provide these individuals for prosecution? There's been no uh, communication with the Russians about this. We'll follow the ordinary process uh, of seeking cooperation and extradition. Thank you, Rush. Heard it. That was the Deputy Attorney General, Rod Rosenstein, and he is the person, because the Attorney General, Jeff Sessions, has to recuse himself from all things having to do with the Russia investigation. It is Rod Rosenstein, the Deputy Attorney General, that oversees what we essentially in shorthand call the Mueller probe. And what you just heard today is the cleanest and clearest explanation of how the Russians interfered in the 2016 election. And if you read the indictment, it is a essentially a bit of a page turner and how they did it, how they infiltrated social media, how they um, duped American citizens uh, and how they tried to cover their tracks. Let's go to the White House first. Kristen Welker is there and Kristen, uh, the word hoax is in my head over and over. This is not a hoax from the Department of Justice right now. Does the White House acknowledge that the idea of Russian interference is no longer a hoax? Well, I can tell you that the talking point, Chuck, right now out of the White House uh, is that the way in which this entire process is being handled, and this is from one White House official, underscores that they see President Trump uh, as a part of the process, not a part of the problem. This White House official telling me that President Trump was briefed personally by Rod Rosenstein, as well as FBI Director Christopher Wray at the White House earlier today. Now, in terms of that issue, uh, President Trump has considered consistently referred to the Russia probe as a hoax. We've consistently pressed the White House to say, uh, do they now acknowledge this is legitimate? So far, uh, you haven't had that from the president himself, Chuck. You have a number of top officials here trying to choose their words very carefully to say that they respect the process and they want it to be concluded as quickly as possible. But there is no issue that gets under the president's skin more than the Russia probe. He sees this as potentially delegitimizing his election. The White House right now very focused on what we heard at the end from the deputy attorney general. The fact that uh, according to what we just heard, no U.S. citizens wittingly participated uh, in this attempt to collude in the election. So I think that is the word you're going to hear them go back to. Uh, And of course, this is getting closer and closer to the Oval Office. We know that Steve Bannon, the president's former top advisor, spoke with Robert Mueller. We know that there are discussions underway right now between the president's legal team and the special counsel about a potential interview with the president. So this is something that continues to roil this White House more than a year in, Chuck. But Kristen, any concern that the Russians did it? Like, I understand they seem to be wanting to be focused on how to deflect connections to the Trump campaign. But what I noticed here is it doesn't sound like anybody is, oh, wow, now we've got to get refocused on the sanctions situation. Nothing like that. Right. Not yet. It's very early. And we should say we've reached out to a range of White House officials. So far, we've only heard from one uh, who says, look, yes, these are the first indictments. And that is significant. It's going to make it very hard uh, for them to say that this is now or for the president to argue that this is in any way a hoax. There's no doubt this is a significant step. Uh, But again, Chuck, I think what you're going to hear, the talking point, at least at this point, uh, is going to be to try to put the focus on that word unwitting, uh, that sure. essentially Americans were duped and that anyone from the Trump campaign who may have had interactions with any of these Russians right. were duped. Chuck. Kristen Welker at the White House for us. Hallie Jackson was in the room at Justice Department. Hallie, let me check in with you very quickly. I, I, right at the end, the deputy attorney general was asked, um, uh, or, do we have any assurances that the Russians are going to turn over these folks? Um, It sounds like the way he worded it was a glorified way of saying that it's not going to happen. But what, what do you know? Yeah, I mean, you heard the same thing from Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein there, Chuck, on that topic and on what happens next. And I do think that there is still a critical question that has not been answered yet, which is what is this administration doing to make sure this does not happen again in the midterms just a few months from now and in 2020? It is not clear what steps have been taken. You hear from, for example, the Department of Homeland Security. You hear from the White House in our interactions with folks at the West Wing that they are working on this. But this is, I think underscores and clarifies what a critical issue this will be for the elections coming up down the road. I also want to point out one other thing, because the deputy attorney general was pressed on the idea, as you and Kristen have been talking about, that 
no American had had wittingly known about the Russian interaction here. But remember his words here. He talked specifically about in this indictment these yeah. specific allegations, and I think that that is worth noting. Also worth noting, he gave the same response when asked about this potentially altering the outcome of the election. Again, in this indictment, in these allegations here, Chuck. I'm so glad you pointed out that phraseology. I picked up on it, too. He kept saying, this indictment right. says, this right. indictment These. says. There was no yeah. conclusion drawing by him at all. Hallie Jackson, thanks very much. Let me go back to Tom Costello. Tom, I know you've been reading more of this. Well, I, the scope I of this is it, The scope is I'm so sorry, big. Go ahead. It is. No, what I, it does seem to be, it is Facebook finally coming clean yeah. at some point that seemed to unlock a whole yeah. bunch of, of avenues here for the Justice Department. The allegation here is that the Russians took full advantage of U.S. social media, not only Facebook, but Twitter, that they used election-related hashtags, Trump 2016, hashtag Trump train, MAGA, make America great again, I won't protect Hillary, hashtag. All of these uh, were specifically used, it says here, quote, to uh, use any opportunity to criticize Hillary and the rest, quoting the Russian operative, also encouraging minorities not to vote, encouraging the notion that there was widespread voter fraud, uh, also a false Facebook posts, organizing pro-Trump rallies or uh, anti-Hillary rallies, and paying for people to dress up in Hillary uh, costumes in which she was in prison guard. Uh, it really an astonishing uh, all-out effort that went not only through the election, but even post-election organizing, it says here, post-election uh, rallies, if you will, for President-elect Trump. Uh, and all of this, uh, as they were discovered, page 24 of the indictment, moving on to page, the next page, it talks about the fact that they were discovered by the FBI. I'm quoting now a Russian operative quoted in the indictment. We had a slight crisis here at work. Right. The FBI busted our activity. Not a joke. I got preoccupied with covering tracks together with our colleagues. I created all these pictures and posts, and the Americans believed that was, it was written by their people quoting a Russian operative there on page 24 of the indictment once the FBI was on to them. The scope of this is absolutely astonishing how hundreds, hundreds of various accounts to create potentially thousands or more posts, fake posts on Twitter and Facebook to manipulate the election. And we should emphasize here, the indictments of these Russian individuals, the likelihood they ever face trial depends everything on Vladimir Putin deciding to let them be extradited. Yeah, that's not going to happen. I mean, the, the point, it seems to me, the point of, the, of uh, Mueller's team laying this out now is mm -hmm. to essentially try to wake up uh, the, the country to the scope of the fraud, uh, or more precisely, the scope of the cyber war, information war being waged against the United States by Russia. Uh, in the view of many cyber experts I've talked to over the past year or so, and I got to say, I've been immersed in this in an academic pursuit as well over the last six months. We are, in fact, engaged right. in an all out cyber warfare with the Russians, mm -hmm. and we're very much uh, not even playing on the same uh, field that they're on. Well, we're, we're playing by a certain set of, set of ethics. Right. I, I think that, that they might not be playing on Tom Costello. Thank you very much. One last word. Let me go back to Hallie Jackson. This indictment, it seems, seems to me, Hallie, is Mueller make, essentially showing the country this is how we did it. And now, okay, lawmakers, it is up to you to punish the Russians here. Is the president ready to start actually punishing them with sanctions? Remember what the president has said up to this point so far, Chuck, which is when asked about Russian interference in the election, after months of being pressed, he said, yes, it may have been the Russians and it may have been other countries as well. There is no evidence of that today. Coming out of the Department of Justice, the question now for the White House is not just what are you going to do to stop this again, it's also what are you going to do to punish the Russians? They've kept some sanctions in place, but you know that the president has been loath to go after Vladimir Putin in some ways that people on Capitol Hill would like to see him do because he says he wants to cooperate in other areas. Let's see if this changes the game for him. Yeah, we shall see, and let's see if this changes the game with a lot of people that have been quietly supporting him. Hallie Jackson uh, at the Justice Department for us. For Tom Costello, Hallie Jackson, Kristen Welker, extraordinary developments and fascinating new details in this story today. It's unfolding now. It's been unfolding for well over a year, clearly far from over. But this is not a hoax. This is the details of how the Russian did it.
Now we'll have full details tonight on the NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. For now, and for all of my colleagues, I'm Chuck Todd, NBC News, Washington. Andrea, I'm greeting from Munich, where I'm at the Munich Security Conference right now. This has just hit here, and lots of people are buzzing about it. Um, it doesn't surprise me, right? I know this is so, uh, the head of it, of course, is somebody very close to Putin. Let's make no mistake about it. This is not some rogue organization that would have done this without some uh, cover from the Kremlin. But what is really impressive about what I've learned so far is just how much we now think about it. Uh, and I'm, you know, on the actual indictments of Americans and conspiracies that you were talking about, that's somewhat of a different matter. For me, what's very important about this is two things. One is there can be no doubt that the Russians now, uh, you know, very deliberately and strategically intervene in our election. Um, and I hope this is you now enough for our president to now say that as a pretty overwhelming evidence about what they were trying to do. And uh, Mike McFall, Matt Miller is still with us. Matt Miller, uh, having been at the at Justice Department, is it unusual that the president would only have been briefed today on this? It's very unusual for an indictment like this. Look, on a, a, a normal criminal indictment, the White House is not briefed in advance unless it's something that's going to make a lot of news. Then you might tell the president the morning of. But for a national security inv indictment, those rules typically go out the window. And this is the, the type of thing that would be uh, discussed um, uh, through the NSC. Uh, the, the State Department would have a chance to weigh in before any indictments were brought. Uh, the intelligence community would have a chance to weigh in before the indictments were brought. And the president would be aware of it well in advance because this is not just a criminal criminal justice question. This is a national security question. It imp impacts uh, diplomacy. It would be, it would be, you know, in most cases, you would see the president a part of the decision-making process before indictments like this were brought. It is really unusual, and I think it speaks to the unusual nature of this case, where uh, the, 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 the Russian activity is not the only thing being investigated, but the president himself uh, and his campaign is under investigation. It just sh shows how unusual this is that in a case of major national security significance, because let, let's, let's not, Let's um, uh, not forget, the Russians could retaliate over these indictments. Uh, we have seen them uh, do that in the past when the, when the U.S. takes action like this. That the president of the United States was only briefed this morning, uh, that is highly unusual. And uh, we, we can't be sure, but there is the other fact, which NBC has been reporting, of how many top people uh, close to the, the Oval Office do not have full, sec, uh, full uh, top secret security clearances. So there are people in the White House and in the NSC, including division heads, who may not have been cleared to even see this. Yeah, that's that's exactly right. Uh, everything about this is, is unusual. Um, uh, if you look at if you look through the indictment, um, there are a number of instances where uh, some of the evidence that, that is used in the indictment seems to be evidence that our intelligence community probably generated. For example, you have uh, internal uh, emails that <coughs> that Russian officials sent to each other. Uh, you have to think that that is the result of, of uh, uh, hacks that our own intelligence community uh, w were able to execute. Um, you, you do wonder uh, how comfortable the Justice Department and maybe some people inside the intelligence community would have been with sharing this information with senior uh, White House officials in advance, given that, that some of them are also subjects of this investigation. I'm not sure whether Jill Weinbanks is still with us. Jill, if you are in New York, uh, this is a, a major indictment, obviously, from uh, the special counsel, but your experience as a former Watergate prosecutor, what does this tell you about the range and depth of what Robert Mueller is doing. I think this is the heart of what he's doing. I think he has been focused on obstruction because the evidence has been so out there for him on that. And this is what he started out at, looking at the underlying crime of Russian meddling in our election. And this is the first step in that. Now the next step would be who in America participated, if anyone, wittingly with the Russians. And also who else has obstructed justice would be part of it as well. And what is the legal significance of the criminal conspiracy, which is at the heart of this indictment? The conspiracy is a great tool for prosecutors because it allows evidence from any member of the conspiracy to be used against all the members of the conspiracy. So for example, that's why Richard Nixon was named an unindicted co-conspirator, because that allowed the White House tapes to be used against all of the participants 
in the conspiracy to obstruct justice in that case. So it is a very good tool, very helpful to a prosecutor, um, completely legitimate. Um, no defense lawyer is going to argue with the ability to use that evidence against all of the participants. Uh, Joe, at the same time, the indictment says that any of the Americans who were contacted by the, uh, these Russians posing as Americans, that any of the Americans were unwitting. That does not rule out down the road that they could find others who may have been involved in some fashion. Exactly. For two things. One, Rosenstein said that at this point there is no evidence that anyone wittingly participated. So we have to listen to that, which is a clue that there may be other people they are investigating, and that could be the next step. Uh, it also shows the huge sophistication of this operation, that it must have involved the Kremlin. This isn't just something that a couple of people got together and did. There were millions of dollars in funding. There were lots of people who traveled to America, adopted false personas, and misled Americans according to the indictment that we have before us now. So that that's why the people charged to our, not charged, but the people named to our Americans were not witting. They thought they were dealing with Americans who shared their political views when in fact it wasn't. And it was, as was said by Rosenstein, the original intent was to just sow discord and to mislead the public and to just interfere with the election in general. And then at some point they switched to hurting Hillary Clinton and helping uh, Donald Trump. So that was the goal ultimately of the uh, Russian operation. We're told the State Department was also briefed on this. Uh, there, it's, it's very clear that this kind of sophisticated operation with people involved who were so close to Vladimir Putin could not have done this without help on the ground from some of the intelligence operatives working out of their embassy and their consulates. Uh, Putin controls everything in Russia. Of course, he is a former KGB agent. That's how he started out. But that's the way Russia works. I worked for Motorola in St. Petersburg, and I know for a fact that that is how it goes in Russia. And so I think the State Department is, of course, correct in this. Uh, NBC Chief White House Correspondent Hallie Jackson uh, joins me right uh, at the Justice Department where Attorney General Rosenstein, Deputy Attorney General Rosenstein, just briefed the press. Hallie, uh, this fascinating briefing from Rod Rosenstein sticking to the actual framework, the terms of exactly the right. indictment itself very mm -hmm. carefully uh, because this is an indictment that is fraught with political ramifications given uh, what is alleged in terms of meddling in the election. And you saw Rod Rosenstein, uh, to, to put it colloquially, Andrea, hoping to not sort of step outside the lanes, step outside the bounds of what he was here to talk about, repeatedly referring, and I think he hit the nail on the head, to this indictment when he was asked specifically about, for example, whether this altered the outcome of the election, whether any Americans wittingly, that's a critical word there, wittingly cooperated. He said there's nothing in these allegations, in this indictment, that reflects that. But again, sticking to the scope of what he had in front of him. There are still some real questions now that this administration has to answer relating broadly to what stops Russia from doing this again in 2020, what stops them from doing this again six months down the road, seven months down the road in the midterm elections here this year. There are also questions that the president is going to need to answer. And I know that uh, you've likely had this conversation with our colleagues over at the White House currently, uh, which is what is the president going to do now? Will Russia face sanctions on this? Will the president call and demand Vladimir Putin uh, submit to extradition these, these people who have been indicted? Likely not, right? But there are real questions that the president will have to answer. And I think another one of those questions, Andrea, besides just the nuts and bolts is, does the president, given this criminal indictment now, believe that this is still a witch hunt or a hoax, as he has repeatedly said many times in the past? And I think that that is where all of our questioning will be directed today. I'm actually going to race over there so we can grab the president. He's leaving, as you know, for Florida in about an hour and five minutes from now. Uh, there will be an opportunity for reporters to shout questions at him, and I imagine it will be a packed South Lawn. And I know you've got to race over there, but just to button this down, as yeah. you just alluded to, the White House and the State Department and the Treasury have been falling yes. all over themselves trying to explain why they have not imposed sanctions on Russia, despite an overwhelming majority, a veto-proof majority, in those new sanction uh, that le legislation that was passed by Congress.
And the Treasury Secretary, others have pointed to some sanctions that are still in place against Russia, sanctions that have been already put in place. Uh, but the question has been about new sanctions or even just a tougher tone, I think, toward Russia. What you've heard from the president repeatedly has been a hesitance, Andrea, to go too far because, as he says, he wants to try to get Vladimir Putin on board with, for example, uh, what's happening in Syria with other issues of international importance, the fight against ISIS and so on. And he wants to have Russian cooperation there. That is why he at least publicly has said that he isn't going and taking sort of that, that very tough tone that some on Capitol Hill have been demanding to see, have been calling on him to deliver. Uh, so the question now is, does this indictment change that? Does this change the game for Donald Trump and for his advisors in the West Wing, Andrea? Hallie Jackson, thank you. I know you're going to run right back to the White House and uh, try to get some questions to the president as he leaves for Florida today. And Ken Delaney in, in our Washington bureau, let's talk about yet another indictment. Yeah, Andrea, it's a criminal information against a man named Richard Pinedo, one count of identity fraud, um, accusing him of knowingly transferring, possessing, and using uh, over through interstate commerce, a means of identification of other persons. Uh, when you see an information like this, it usually means that someone is cooperating with the investigation. Uh, I believe Jill Weinbank said previously that, you know, if there's a conspiracy alleged like this, it stands to reason Mueller has some participants in the conspiracy. This may be one of those participants. Uh, we, we need to do some more reporting on this, but one count of identity fraud against apparently an American named Richard Pinedo just filed by Robert Mueller, Andrea. And apparently it is, I'm reading it now, just as it was handed to me, but he has pleaded guilty to this. So there are uh, clearly some yep, conversations going on. I see it, I see it now. There's a plea agreement also filed. Yep. Uh, so he has pleaded guilty. Um, there is a plea agreement. Let's see if we can see the date of this. February 2nd, 2018. Um, and then he's stipulating to a, to a number of facts uh, here in this plea agreement. We'll, we'll take a look at it, Andrea. Well, we will continue with that. And uh, just to bring everyone up to date, I'm Andrea Mitchell in Washington, continuing our breaking news coverage. Special counsel Robert Mueller has handed down new indictments against 13 Russian nationals and three Russian entities. The deputy attorney general made the announcement last hour. The indictment says Russian operatives worked to support the campaign of Donald Trump and to disparage or denigrate the campaign of Hillary Clinton. Uh, joining me here on set is Carol Lee, one of our political and investigative reporters. Carol, uh, this is a remarkable document as you've been able to go through it because what it alleges is that there was grassroots operations, uh, that these Russians were operational through false identities on the ground here in the U.S., holding rallies, staging other operations, not just working through social media from someplace overseas. It's, yeah, you're absolutely right. It's essentially a Russian infiltration of the American tradition of political activism. Uh, you know, you can't read this in any other way. You have a number of Americans, uh, unwittingly, according to the indictment, who were in contact with Russians to basically organize political rallies to support one candidate over the other. And what they did it in a way that was designed to mirror how an individual would already be thinking or, you know, leaning towards acting in a political campaign or um, and, and specific type of political activism. And that is what is really startling about this, because we knew before this happened, this came down, that there was an effort to do this online. But the fact that this was something that Americans were engaging in unknowingly with Russian essentially, you know, with Russian people sent by Russia is is really startling. Um, and it makes you wonder sort of how deep it all went. I mean, this is you have not only that piece of it, but you have the Russians setting up servers in the United States, spending one point two five million dollars on this operation, employing, uh, you know, hundreds of people, everyone from people to engage with someone like you who's uh, or anyone who's thinking about um, doing something politically active and and to having people, you know, do tech support. Um, so this is really more detail than we've seen. And it's I think it's going to take some time for everyone to go through it and and just grasp exactly exactly what's all in here. And one of those people going through it is NBC News investigations reporter Tom Winter joining me by phone. Tom, you've been able to read through more of this indictment. 
Yeah, so it appears that the uh, individual, uh, and we should be clear here, Andrea, this is another person uh, who is now wrapped up in the Mueller case. His name is Richard Pinedo. He's 28 years old, and uh, he has signed a, uh, a plea agreement uh, with the Office of Special Counsel. He has pled guilty. He did so on the 2nd of February of this year. And the charges pertain to, uh, allegedly pertain to his, um, uh, allegedly pertain to his involvement as far as getting uh, uh, getting compromised identities and compromised bank accounts. Uh, we know from the plea agreement, and this is significant, uh, and we can now report this, that uh, Pinedo is cooperating with the Office of Special Counsel. That's according to the terms and conditions of his plea agreement. And so he'll now be expected to assist the Office of Special Counsel. If we look at how uh, Mueller's team has done this in the past, when they've put out a cooperator, um, they've put that person out who may have been involved in some of the other uh, previous indictments or other things that they've announced. If we look at the, the, the major indictment against the 13 Russian nationals, we see that they were able to get false identities and they were able to have false accounts. So perhaps, and we need to do a little bit more reporting, uh, uh, this person who is, uh, who we've just learned has been uh, indicted and has decided to plea, Richard Pinedo, that in fact he may have been one of the people that was involved in that scheme, but we need to look into that. Either way, as I said, he has uh, chosen to plead guilty um, to a uh, several page uh, uh, criminal information. So that's going to state the facts that he agrees that uh, uh, with the prosecutors uh, and the things that he did, and in addition is cooperating. So that's a little bit of new news. We were I was listening to you and Ken as we're obviously all going through uh, right now over 50 pages of documents that we've received in just the last hour and 15 minutes from the Office of Special Counsel. And we now have another person who's coordinating in that investigation. One other thing that I might mention Andrea, going back to the indictment involving the 13 Russian nationals, that was signed directly by Robert Mueller himself. Um, in the other uh, indictments and some of the other uh, paperwork that has uh, uh, that has come down in the course of this uh, in the course of this investigation, those uh, those pleadings and those indictments have all been signed by the what we would call a line prosecutor. That's a prosecutor that's working for Mueller that will actually be charging that case. In the 37-page indictment against the uh, 13 Russian nationals, uh, Mueller himself signed it. So I mentioned that as a point of color, uh, but obviously we have a lot of activity here this afternoon with yet another person uh, now cooperating with Mueller's team. And one of the people that's, coordinating, uh, that's cooperating with his team is, of course, uh, retired uh, Lieutenant General Michael Flynn. So uh, the people that are coordinating are starting to add up for Mueller. Uh, Tom Winter with that uh, very useful information as well. Uh, Ken Delaney, and as you continue going through these, these indictments, and Ari Melber as well, I want to bring in Ari first as an attorney, Ari. What is what Robert Mueller has done, has done today tell you about the state of play? of his investigation. Uh, today, February 16th, is a dividing line in this probe and more widely in our understanding of Russians' efforts to meddle in the U.S. election. Because today, you have Robert Mueller and in that dramatic, uh, although at times understated, press conference by his boss, Rod Rosenstein, a Trump official, a Trump appointee, you have a statement from the U.S. government itself alleging exactly the nature of the plot, uh, naming names of Russian nationals and Russian entities with direct lines, financial and otherwise, to the Kremlin, to Vladimir Putin, to exactly some of the instrumentalities and federal laws they say they broke uh, to basically have a conspiracy to try to impact the election. As Rosenstein was quick to point out, uh, that does not mean that the outcome of the election was changed. That's not a knowable thing in the eyes of the law anyway, really. Um, but this is a hugely significant turning point. You think about all the times we've heard the president say, who knows what happened? Uh, well, Bob Mueller and Rod Rosenstein today are saying they know, and it was Russia. And not only that, uh, moments ago, what you have just been reporting on, uh, this heretofore unknown individual, Mr. Richard Panetto, is a U.S. person. So our headline right now, Andrea, today, this Friday, this incredible piece of news that affects law, politics, and our society is something Bob Mueller knew that apparently no one else did, because it was all the way back February 2nd, uh, where we see Richard Panetto uh, basically pled guilty to this type of identity fraud. And the implication here that we're unra unraveling is that he did it in concert with these Russians. And that brings me to a final point, Andrea. One of the key lines in today's indictment of uh, those Russians says that they conspired with individuals both known 
and unknown to the grand jury. Uh, that is significant because it means that there are people that Bob Mueller has effectively flagged as co-conspirators, and there are other people, according to the government, that he has flagged to himself and to his investigators, but not yet to the grand jury, and certainly not to those of us covering it on the outside. So that would suggest uh, a criminal process here that has more shoes to drop. And when you talk about more shoes to drop, we know uh, or suspect according to reports and according to our own uh, inferences from what people have said, that Mueller is also engaged in ongoing negotiations with Mueller's people with one of those who was indicted previously, and that is the deputy to Paul Manafort, Mr. Gates. That's right. There has been a hotbed of observation and what I would call informed speculation given the dramatic changes that Mr. Gates made to his legal team. Uh, and so if he becomes another cooperator, let's take a step back. You have high, high profile individuals like uh, Mr. Flynn cooperating. You have more peripheral or low profile individuals like Mr. Papadopoulos cooperating. You have the potential cooperation of Mr. Gates. That would make three out of four out of people linked to the Trump campaign. You have a new person that no one had ever heard of until this hour, Andrea, this breaking news of Richard Panetto, he has pled, he is cooperating. Now, he is not in a position to know a lot about any potential alleged international collusion, but he is in a different position that investigators care a lot about. He's in a position to know exactly who was moving the money and whether they were Russians abroad or Russians inside the United States and whether they had other help or not and who was on those emails. I mean, this is, at the end of the day, a digital conspiracy in part. And that means if you have people who know where the digital records are, that is a treasure trove for investigators. And Gates, if Gates, Ari, does turn and becomes a cooperative witness, that can open the door to increasing a great deal of pressure on Paul Manafort. That's right. That can, that, look, he is essentially the partner uh, financially and otherwise of Paul Manafort. If he is to turn, uh, one can guess that Paul Manafort at a minimum is someone he is turning on, in addition to whatever he may or may not know. I don't know what Mr. Gates knows. I know that Bob Mueller makes cooperation agreements when he thinks he can get something. He doesn't make cooperation agreements to get nothing. Uh, and that's, that's just how it works legally. So Mr. Gates could have information on Mr. Manafort, on other individuals in the Trump orbit, or again, because we talk so much about the campaign part of this, he may just have other information about individuals. In other words, take a step back from the politics. It appears that Mr. Panetto has pled guilty to, you know, to helping Russians conspire to defraud the United States, that's the legal term, or to help impact our election. So most people, I think, certainly people in the law, but most people in general would say that's a bad thing. Let's catch that American. I don't know Mr. Panetto's politics. I don't know why he did what he did. Uh, but Bob Mueller and Rod Rosenstein, a Trump appointee, again, I mentioned, obviously think he has to pay for what he did, and he is now cooperating. So it goes to who was helping, and were they U.S. persons? Were they Americans? Were they politically involved? Another thing I was going to flag as I was reading through this, it's very notable that there's only two candidates uh, that Mueller states were basically the intended beneficiaries of this Ru Russian operation, uh, Donald Trump and Bernie Sanders. And he says, according again to these new filings, they were against everyone else. They were against other Republicans in the primaries. They were against uh, Hillary Clinton. Uh, but apparently, according to the information that, and the evidence they're going to put in court, that's the two candidates they wanted to help. And to that point, on page 17, and I'm joining, I'm joined now by NBC News national security and justice reporter Julia Ainsley. Julia, you and I have been going through it separately. And on page 17, it says defendants and their co-conspirators and their fictitious online personas to interfere with the 2016 U.S. presidential elec election engaged in operations primarily intended to communicate derogatory information about Hillary Clinton, to denigrate other candidates such as Ted Cruz and Marco Rubio, and to support Bernie Sanders and then candidate Donald Trump. That lays out a political agenda which Ari Melba was just uh, referring to, and uh, it certainly makes it very clear what the aim of this Russian operation was. The Justice Department, where Rod Rosenstein, the Deputy Attorney General, gave us his narrative he, from this. He's really just pulling straight from the indictment here. But what he's showing is that a lot of these people knew Yep. U.S. politics very much from the inside. There were people, there were Russian operatives who came to the U.S. under false identities years ago, and two years even before the election, 
to start understanding these politics and to try to sow discord. But he did even talk about a time where they supported through social media campaigns one rally against Donald Trump and one rally for Donald Trump in New York on the same day. So in some cases, they're picking sides, and in some cases, they're just trying to sow discord. It was pretty interesting. And one of the things that we've learned from the intelligence communities even before this indictment is that as early as Ferguson, they were trying to sow discord by taking sides pro and uh, against Black Lives Matter, for instance. And there's a particular point in this indictment which refers to telling people to vote for candidate, candidate Stein to try to That's increase the third party vote, which would diminish the Hillary Clinton vote. That's true. That was very strategic. And we've seen uh, Russian operatives be able to seize on any moment of discord in the United States, just as we're hearing after this Florida shooting, that there have been Russian bots trying to sow discord after that, just like they would after Ferguson. I mean, these are people who really knew what would make people angry in the United States, what carried a lot of emotion, what could sway their political decisions. But the deputy attorney general said that he didn't see any evidence that this had swayed the outcome of the election. I don't quite know how you could say that in the end and be definitive on that one way or another. Uh, it certainly, according to the people in the Clinton camp, uh, certainly doesn't begin to explore the hacking. And the hacking, which is also a crime, which disrupted the Democratic Convention to a certain extent, which replaced the head of the DNC, uh, which had a number of other ramifications that certainly unsettled the campaign, including the exposure late in the campaign of all of John Podesta, the campaign chairman's emails going back for 10 years. Uh, Carol Lee is still here. We both covered that campaign uh, from all sides and know just how disruptive what WikiLeaks yeah. delivered and Donald Trump from the podium saying, thank you, WikiLeaks, and saying, you know, come on, Russia, give us more. I mean, he was encouraging the hacking of his opponent's campaign. He was, and little did we know all of this other stuff was going on. Um, but that was, you know, we covered that. That was hugely disruptive. It made, it was very strategically done. It was leaked. There was a daily batch. Um, it took the focus off of um, a lot of things that uh, otherwise you would be focusing on on a campaign. But so they had, you know, I think what we're getting here is a picture of a number of different prongs in which the Russians used to try to manipulate our system. And I, I agree with Julia. I think it's right. She's right that you. It's really. I don't understand how anyone can say that we don't know if, how this affected the outcome of of the election. You know, that's not the official stance, and it's something we will probably never know. Uh, but certainly, there were efforts on multiple fronts by the Russian government to try to sway the election. Uh, is Matt Miller still with us? I wanted to ask Matt Miller about where you think this investigation is going now. This is laying out a blueprint of what. Robert Mueller has been doing, it's giving us an unusual, uh, unusual view of what he's been doing in this very closed down operation. Uh, where do you think he's going next? Um, I, I think we got an answer to one of the big questions today, which is we, we've always known that there are two major tracks of this investigation. One, the if you want to call it the collusion aspect, what happened, uh, uh, what happened in, in, in regards to the Russians' interference in the election, uh, and then the second being the obstruction of justice uh, track. On the first track, there was always a question of whether he would just look to indict U.S. individuals if he could find that U.S. individuals had cooperated with Russians, or if he would also bring charges against Russian individuals. He's answered that question now. And so I would expect if he's answered that question in the affirmative with regards to social media activity, that it's appropriate to indict Russian officials for their social media activity and for related you know, actions trying to stage rallies uh, and the like in the United States, he will probably also answer that question in the affirmative with respect to the hack. And so uh, I think you know, unless, he can't, unless he can't get the, the necessary evidence to support an indictment, I would think that we would in the coming months see uh, charges around the actual hack of John Podesta's email and, and the hack of DNC emails. Well, thank you so much. And uh, Brian Williams, our colleague in New York, is going to take over our coverage now. Uh, Brian, a very busy day with these indictments and also, not to be overlooked, an extraordinary statement from Christopher Wray and the FBI that they overlooked a very specific tip on January 5th about the threat from Nicholas Cruz uh, yeah. to do uh, to murder and mayhem 
Absolutely. In Florida. Uh, absolutely. Brian. We have these two dueling stories, one of which, of course, speaks to our presidential election and our current politics. We've gathered together quite a group of uh, analysts uh, and our own reporters. I'm here in New York with Nicole Wallace, among others, uh, former uh, communications director in the Bush White House. You've had a chance to look through this. You've had a chance to talk to folks. Um, I've heard this called an asymmetrical psychological and electronic attack on the United States. Um, I've heard it said that like 9-11, entirely differently, but like 9-11, it used our own system on us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, General Hayden called this a political 9-11 um, when, when describing sort of the scope and the impact and the fact that it was something that we hadn't imagined possible. That was part of why it was possible. I talked to a formal federal prosecutor in contact with this White House who said that he would make two things abundantly clear to Donald Trump and um, whoever's up or down in his inner circle. It's hard to know the kind of week they've had. Um, one. Robert Mueller took the evidence against these 13 Russians to the grand jury and they returned 13 indictments. The notion that Americans don't care about Russian interference, the notion that an American jury can't be presented with evidence of Russian meddling and deliver indictments is false. Donald Trump, I would be surprised and it would be um, foolish for him to continue to suggest that this is a hoax, thinking that people don't understand exactly what the Russians were capable of doing when it comes to our democracy. The the other piece is a little sort of inside the justice and intelligence community that's been under attack by Donald Trump almost since the day he won the election in November. They, this, this source said to me, this is um, Bob Mueller sending a very clear and loud message to the White House that Bob Mueller is ending the debate on behalf of the intelligence community, on behalf of the American Justice Department, on behalf of the FBI, about whether or not Russia meddled. Russia meddled full stop. Um, in the public sphere, this now has to go through a series of filters. We are the first ring of that. Um, by tonight, by tomorrow, what will it look like? And why do you think today? Listen, I, I think that with every new wrinkle in the Mueller probe, we have more questions, not more answers. I mean, I remember being on the air when George Papadopoulos, and you and I have talked about this on and off the air, um, the, the, the guilty plea from George Papadopoulos didn't answer any questions. It just raised new ones. Well, who did George Papadopoulos tell about his contacts with Russians. More recently, Carter Page, a, a figure that became um, really an unwitting um, eye of the storm in the fight between the White House and the FBI over the release of, of the highly politicized uh, Nunes memo that told a very narrow and distorted view of, of, of a surveillance application. The, 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 the FBI wanted to surveil an American. We now have more questions about maybe, maybe Maybe one of the theories they wanted to do that is because he was talking to one of these 13 Russians. We don't know. But in terms of, of how this gets filtered down, it is possible that there are more questions than answers after today. Um, uh, two questions before I bring a former assistant director of the FBI in. Um, if you're a communications director in this White House, um, what do you think they'll say, and what would you counsel them to say? To well, I, listen, things? the communications director in this White House, um, uh, wittingly or unwittingly, is essential is a witness in the in the special counsel investigation. So I don't know if that hampers her ability to counsel the president. I, 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 you know, in in the Bush White House, when there were people who were witnesses in the Valerie Plame leak investigation, they didn't counsel the president on how to respond on the day that Pat Fitzgerald delivered the indictment of Scooter Libby. So I don't even know if this White House communications director is acting as an advisor to this president when there is breaking news from the special counsel. So I don't know who has the job of telling the president how to respond to news like this. In the White House in which I worked, I would have been recused if that was me. But whoever is advising him, I think would be wise to take this former prosecutor's um, advice to heart. I also think that Rod Rosenstein in his press conference was not speaking to the nation. He was speaking to the president because he said over and over again, there is 
nothing in these indictments that suggests that anyone yeah. on the Trump campaign knew, and there is nothing in these indictments that suggests that they did anything wrong. I don't think that's a that I think that is a message and a reassurance needed by one person, Donald Trump. Um, uh, Kristen Welker is at the White House. Kristen, the president uh, is uh, getting ready to fly down to Florida. What do we know? Well, we're hoping we're going to get to shout some questions at the president as he departs, Brian, and get his actual reaction to these 13 indictments. What we know so far is that he was briefed earlier today at the White House personally by the Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein and by FBI Director Christopher Wray. I spoke with one White House official who said, look, that's an indication that they see him as a part of the process, not a part of the problem. Of course, that is subject to interpretation. We also know, Brian, that this is a president who has consistently referred referred to the Russia probe as a hoax. He has said there has been no collusion. So the question becomes, does he still see it that way? How can he still make that case given these 13 indictments? It becomes almost impossible. We've gotten a very different message from his legal team, which has said, look, we want to cooperate uh, with the special counsel, Robert Mueller. In fact, we know that there are negotiations ongoing behind the scenes for a potential interview in some form with the president himself. Now that may take on a written form. There may be a robust back and forth about how that's actually going to play out. But this is an investigation that has consistently gotten closer and closer to the Oval Office. One of his former aides, Steve Bannon, is sitting for some 20 hours with the special counsel in recent days. And so have a whole host of other current and former top officials to this president. This is the one issue that gets under his skin more than anything else. Brian, he sees this as a way to delegitimize his election results. So there's no doubt that this is one more data point that will uh, get under this president's skin, even as he has tried to focus on other issues uh, like infrastructure reform and tax reform, uh, dealing with the issue of immigration. Uh, yet again, Russia front and center today here at the White House. Brian. All right, Kristen Welker at the White House. Again, the president preparing to fly to Florida. First, he has to get from the structure out to Marine One, and that is where reporters hope to ask him some questions, notably. Uh, and remember, uh, White House staff, communication staff, works for the American people. We haven't heard from them since Tuesday of this week. And there are no plans as of this morning to speak to the press corps until Tuesday of next week because we have a holiday weekend coming up. Uh, now, Frank Figluzzi has been standing by to talk to us, former assistant director for counterintelligence at the FBI. Frank, I'm going to just turn it over to you and how you would term and describe what it is we're talking about today, what Rosenstein laid out. Thanks, Brian. So first, this indictment is really confirmation that all of us have been targeted by a foreign government in information warfare and that the battlefield has been our own computer screens. We've been duped through social media into literally showing up at campaign rallies for who is now a person who is now the president of the United States. And we've done so like puppets at the direction of a foreign intelligence service. If you read the indictment and every American should go on the Internet and pull down this indictment and read it, it will read like a Tom Clancy novel, but it is real life intelligence operations today. And you need to understand that the Russian intelligence services built an apparatus with a budget of over a million dollars, hundreds of staffers, departments and units and divisions, all aimed at one thing, throwing us into chaos and then ultimately selecting our trying to select our president for us. We are up against that today. It's the new normal and we've got to fight back. And Brian. Just days ago, you may recall that Secretary of State Tillerson said in response to what do we do about the Russians and meddling and hacking and cyber, and he said, we really, there's not really much we can do. They'll adapt and keep doing it. Mueller answered that today. There is something we can do. We can make it painful for them to continue to do this. Uh, Frank, two questions. Uh, number one, how about paper ballots in the upcoming midterm elections, perhaps in locked boxes, the way our elections used to be carried out state by state? And number two, it also seems to me looking through this 
they have taken advantage of the American mindset. There is a different mindset in this country as opposed to other countries. Uh, Russia comes to mind. And while we as a people, as we've matured, 2018, have become less trusting, we start from a baseline that was really vulnerable to hacking prior to this. Yeah, so a, a couple of thoughts here. There's, a, there's another entity that's been indicted today that we're not talking about, and that's our social media, and that's Silicon Valley, yep. and that's Facebook, and Google, and Twitter, and they need to step up to the plate and read this indictment and start acting like good corporate citizens, because talk about American trust and vulnerability. There are Americans who go online every night and assume that what they're seeing is gospel. It must be true. These are real people. And I'm here to tell you, read the indictment, they're not real. Remember President Trump said, oh, the Russian thing may be a, a hoax, it could be some 400-pound guy sitting in his bed. Today we've learned it's not. It's a Russian intelligence operation. Uh, let's bring in Chuck Rosenberg, former U.S. attorney, senior FBI official, former chief of staff to James Comey. Among other titles, he is currently our favorite, which is MSNBC contributor. Uh, Chuck, uh, a leadoff question for you is, why indict Russians when Americans who may be skeptical of all of this business, looking for a takeaway, see this at the end of the day and, and think, I don't recognize any of these names. They're not living here. What mm -hmm. teeth will this have? Um, what do you think today is perhaps the start of? Well, there's a simple answer to that question and there's a complex answer to the question. The simple answer, Brian, is that these Russians and the organization uh, cited in the indictment broke U.S. law. And so there's sort of a binary choice for right. prosecutors when that happens. You either charge them or you don't. And they decided to. And I think that's the right choice. There's a complex answer as well, which is um, that you need to send a very, very strong message, uh, not just to the folks who broke the law, but to all Americans, as Frank Figluzzi just described, about how they took over and tried to take over um, our social media platforms, our political apparatus, and how corrosive and dangerous this Russian intelligence operation was in the United States. Um, Chuck Rosenberg, we're sitting here in a studio in New York with four of us. All of us have phones in front of us. That's a, that is a new feature of American mm -hmm. society. And back to mindset, I think most of us want to believe people. Most of us look for shiny, familiar, brand names, the institutions we've grown up with, as we have more time to digest what has come out today, think about it, I think that's going to play a, a major part. And you are so right, you and Frank, to spread the blame uh, across everything we consume electronically during the day. Well, that's right. I mean, look, I'm, I'm not trying to blame anyone other than the defendants, Brian, but to your point, the earth has shifted under our feet. And this is a roadmap to how that shift occurred. Uh, there, is, there are things in this uh, indictment that are highly disturbing, uh, but so far, and I'm reading it um, uh, when I have a moment, there's nothing that's terribly surprising. The disturbing part, right, is how vulnerable we are as a society, a trusting society, uh, to these influence operations. 